This week's special guest, former Maple Leafs general manager Gord Stellick, a man who's covered this club forever. Joe Tilly Sports, coming up! Welcome to the program and the aftermath. Yes, indeed, we have a special guest with us today, longtime broadcaster and author, host of Blue and White Tonight on the Fan 590, host of Stellick and Simmer on Sirius XM. He's a regular on Sportsnet's hockey coverage. He's a former host of the Fan 590 Morning Show. He's a former assistant general manager of the New York Rangers, and he's a former general manager of the Toronto Maple Police. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Toronto native, Gord, Stellick, Gord, thank you for being here today. It's great to see you. Don't forget, I worked at Dominion Food Stores mainly because of the meat and <laughs> from Wesley as well. So, you know, it's not like uh, the resume stops with all those things. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that one. Vic, what are you doing, man? How, how can we leave out the Dominion de deal? Okay, okay, let's, Gord, let's begin at the beginning. Okay, so uh, you're pretty much a Maple Leaf lifer. How did it all start with the Maple Leaf organization? You know, Joe, and it's, it's interesting. You've got a great story, too. Everybody's got a great story. And it's uh, when I talk to younger people nowadays, um, I don't mind telling the story, but it's really not as applicable because there's so many courses now to take journalism. There's a, a course at Brock University that's in sports management and that. So my weirdest thing was my connection was Stan Abodiak, who was the pu public relations director of the Toronto Maple Leafs, was the best friend of uh, one of my buddies, the McMurtry family and up in Don Valley Village up in North York. So my buddy Ken got a job in high school working part-time at the Leaf Games on game nights. The next year, Stan Obodiak asked and said there was another opening, so I got in. And then I was going to University of Toronto and just you know loving working game nights. And back in 1976, Howie Starkman left the Toronto Maple Leafs to become the first ever public relations director of the uh, Toronto Blue Jays, so he left. And while I was just doing stuff at the end of game nights, Jim Gregory approached me, uh, the wonderful Jim Gregory, the former general manager, and uh, he wondered if I wanted to do some work in the office to fill the void with Howie being gone, do the press notes and statistics part time. And Joe, the weird thing is, I got it because I could type 70 words a minute back when guys didn't type. And it was, I, when I say guys, it was a sexist environment back then. So that's how I got in part time. And uh, then it was a small office. And I kept going to University of Toronto and doing this bigger part-time job. And I got to know Harold Ballard because he lived there. And uh, he kind of took a shine to me. And then one day it just said, would you like to, you know, come work here? So people kind of say, oh, how'd your dad, who, who'd your dad know? My dad was Ernie of Ernie's TV Repair. And he never came to a game. He wasn't <laughs> interested in, in the game. He, he was a great dad. But so that was it. So it was a weird, weird confluence of fortuitous events for me. Yeah, like Ernie used to fix Bill Waters TV, who was on the show last week. That's and, correct. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. that Natty was involved in the babysitting over there. No, this is too small a world, but this is crazy. And now, so if you don't, if you're not typing seventy words a minute, you, you're not getting anywhere near Maple Leaf Gardens. We got a different, probably guest on here today. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. Never mind being GM. Not being a guest on here today would really hurt. OK, that's the part that would really hurt. And, 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 and you know, Joe, you're asked the same thing as well. So I always say to young people, have something that's a point of difference. Right. Like have like like if you want to get me kill the social media stuff that the old guys like us aren't so good at, you know. And so it's weird. My point of difference, I didn't do it intentionally. What was I type 70 words a minute if I you know, so I didn't have that lucky little break and then have something to be able to offer that it wasn't someone that could just do. The, like it was about a six page handout. It was pretty, you know, there's no computers back then. So there was a lot of research involved, but a lot of guys could have done it. But as Jimmy Gregory said, and don't bug the secretaries, they called them secretaries back then, you know, they had enough work. So I had to type it out and the old Gestetner, you know, and, and uh, churn it out like a teacher did in public school. And, you know, yeah. that, that was that that was a point of difference. I love the smell of that ink. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, so yeah. <laughs> I used to sniff the teacher's papers. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm glad so, you said papers. Okay, so you, 
yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> okay, so, so, uh, Stan Abode, I love, I love the names you bring up, Howie, uh, Starkman, and Stan Abode, yeah, great guys, Jim Gregory, great guy. Um, Harold, Harold Bellator, you, not everybody's good, but he's going to agree with that one, that he's a great guy, but how did you end up, okay, so here we are, in, in, in April 1988, uh, Least general manager Jerry McNamara showing the door his replacement, thirty year old assistant with a club named Gord Stell. Like, how did that come about? Yeah, so I mean, it was a very small front office. So I was very like, so when I started in the early nineteen eighties, you know, I went from the two extremes that uh, I would uh, have to watch um, the phones at lunch hour because we only had one secretary to typing out Boria Somming's new contract at the behest of Harold Ballard, right? So um, you so you got experienced in so many different things. And so it hit me at some point that being, you know, a potential general manager wasn't out of the realm of possibilities. I didn't expect it to happen so soon. The year before, uh, Ballard made me GM of the New Market Saints in the American Hockey League, and that was perfect. And I thought, you know, I, I would, that was a great way to grow, and I'd be there for a number of years. And then less than a year later, uh, he fired Jerry McNamara and never really replaced him. I, 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 so Dick Duff, John Brophy, and myself were sort of an interim triumv triumvirate by default. And um, the season ended in 1988. We lost to Detroit in six. Uh, and the last game uh, was a terrible game of Maple Leaf Gardens and fans threw sweaters on the ice and caps on the ice and all yeah. that. It was just, uh, you know, so the next morning, Joe, um, Ballard came up. And uh, he'd been talking to John Brophy and, and he kind of was, you can see him trying to think things through and, and uh, you know, Brof, I, lo I love Brof, but Brof's ideas uh, were a little bit over the top, like get rid of Borea Salming, get rid of, you know, all these kind of things. And yeah. uh, so, yeah. so I kind of, I kind of went back at Ballard a bit and he said, well, wait a sec, so you got some kind of different ideas and, and that I said, well, do you want me to tell you what you want to hear or what, um, you know, uh, what I really think? And he goes, well, no, I want to hear what you really think, which really wasn't always the way. So, Again, using yeah. my typing skills, Joe, it comes into place again. I said, okay, I'll put it down in ink. And I did I did an 18-page memo, which takes a bit of time, and I yeah. about everything, about everything. And then then left it with him, say about a day later or two days later. And then for the next few days, he'd come in. Like he, he sometimes he's just in his house coat because he lived there, and he'd be reading my memo, yeah. right? And he'd say, is this what you think about whatever? <laughs> so um, that Sunday, uh, the Toronto Star came. And the front page, Milt Dunnell announced I'd be the next general manager. Like So uh, Milt Dunnell was Bar Ballard's pipeline to the media. So sure. that's how I found out. I wasn't officially the GM till about four days later. And I kind of hoped like a senior guy would come in. Like my hope was that some he'd go after a senior guy and I could be that guy's right-hand guy. I, w I really wasn't thinking um, uh, or, or advocating myself for the general manager's role, but uh, I guess he felt comfortable with me, and he, he liked what he had to say. And to, to be honest, the world, his world was pretty small by, back then, you know. So I think in in the number of people he trusted, and the number of people that were still alive that you know he trusted, it wasn't very yeah, big. Uh, well, that's you know you he he took a few days to read that eighteen page memo, obviously. And Milt Dunnell's a guy who breaks the story, and unbeknownst to you, you you're the new general manager. Although although I'm sure that's what you were hoping for. So you're the youngest general manager in NHL history. I don't know, maybe sports history. I can't. I can't think of anybody who's uh, who is younger than that. I mean, what a, what a what an incredible scenario. But what was that like? What, what was your what was going through your head at that time? Well, it, it was um, you know, it, like if you never get married, it's like having a wedding, right? Without a potential divorce down the road, it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful day, wonderful day that way. But I, uh, I went right back up to my office. So like I knew the landscape. Like so, imagine if you get if you get hired up from outside and you got to go and you got to meet the people and you got to learn whether you want to call it the culture, the way things work. I mean, that's what I will find. Out, I found out later when I worked for the New York Rangers. But in this case, like I really knew everything and I knew Ballard and and that, so I could kind of get at it. And and uh, I. Um, I, I really uh, made you know like a lot of inroads in the first few months, and then he had his um, last big health episode. He he wouldn't pass away till about eighteen months after that, but he just kind of disappeared for about five weeks in the summer, six weeks. He had quintuple heart bypass surgery, and you know when he came back for the start of the season, 
the circus had kind of arrived as far as, uh, you know, um, his situation with Yolanda and the family and, and other things like that, which was really unfortunate and, 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 uh, um, and, and took away with what I was trying to do with the hockey team, especially because I, I had a good way with him, you know, prior to that last episode. Well, a lot of people had difficulty with Harold, uh, as you know, um, a lot of, you know, you talk to a lot of old players like Borea Salming and, and, and Brad Smith, and who we've had in the show and, and guys like that. And the players all seem to really like him. Like Dave Hutchison loved, loved him. And, and uh, Jamie McCowan loved him. I mean, uh, he was, he, he uh, enamored himself to the players, but what was it like? What were your, what were you, what are your thoughts about Harold? How would you sum up your, your thoughts about Harold? Well, you met him as well. And I think the first thing a lot of people would say was, wow, he's really a nice guy. He's really a nice man. I think people, um, that image that, uh, uh, like, like Joe, most people are the reverse. If, you're, if you've got a boss nowadays, uh, they could be tyrants and jerks behind the scene, but they would want a positive public persona. He was almost the opposite because he loved getting the, being in the, you know, being in the media was way different back then. It was everything. It was everything. It, it, you know, it meant you're a big shot. It, it was a way of conveying everything. It meant you were important. And so he could, it, he just, that was his drug. So he knew if you said something normal, it wouldn't get page one. So he'd be a guy that would look like a tyrant, look like a jerk, look like a sexist, look like whatever. And then, you know, he'd plop himself in your office for a nice morning chat the next day. But meanwhile, there's a headline in the paper that may have skewered you a little bit, right? And he would just kind of go, right. ah, don't worry about that stuff. But about the players, yeah, he like he liked, you know, he was living a dream in his 70s and 80s. Like he, he never thought he'd get the Toronto Maple Leafs and he got the Toronto Maple Leafs. And he liked being one of the guys. And, and the issues that came up with guys like Daryl Sittler, Lanny McDonald and Mike Palmatier and that, they were all related to Punch Imlach coming back the second time around. Mm -hmm. and, and Punch, by the way, was very good to me, his brief second time around. But obviously it wasn't a real successful time. But, yeah, like like the, you know, maybe he wasn't the highest paying owner out there about contracts and things like that. But but he, he loved being with the guys and it was a very small entourage that traveled. And, and, uh, and, and he treated them well, was very friendly and loved shooting the breeze. What was your uh, what was the best deal that you pulled off in your in your, your time with the Maple Leafs? You, what deal are you most proud of? Well, I first of all, uh, um, or contract. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, yeah. Well, no, the, the, well, I'll tell you the Wendell contract. That's the one I'm proudest of. But also the uh, the deals like Kenny Reggett for two first round picks. Of course, that then started the whole joke about we took three players from Belleville, but still, I got two first round picks for Kenny Reggett, Rob Ramage for a second round pick. Uh, Lou Francesetti for a fifth round pick and he scored over 20 goals that time. And, um, you know, so I, I was happy with whatever, you know, the, the deals there were uh, obviously uh, always remembered for the Russ Cortnell, John Cordick deal, which there were a lot of mitigating factors about that. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, it is what it is. And I mean, Russ, Russ is probably the player I, I liked the best or got to know the best uh, during my time with the Leafs from the time he was drafted as an 18 year old. And uh, unfortunately, him and John Brophy, it wasn't the same. But I'll tell you, the Wendell Clark contract, Joe, was one that he had just finished up his first entry-level contract. And um, he, he was the number one overall pick. And back then, his salary was 100, 110, 120. He got 175,000 signing bonus, spread out a little bit. And plus, we paid $3,000 to put a satellite dish on his parents' place in Kelvington, Saskatchewan, so they could watch the games. That's what it was. So he's coming out of his first contract. And his agents, Don Meehan, and Wendell that third year had missed a lot of games, about 60 games with the back issues. But so Harold liked him, but we were going over all the contracts and, you know, just sort of looking at Wendell's making 120. I said, yeah, but his contract's up. And he said, well, he's not looking for a raise, is he? And I go, holy crap, like Donnie Meehan's looking for 400, <laughs> okay? So so Harold <laughs> thinks 120 is the goal, you know. So we go on all summer go back and forth with Donnie me in a little bit. And then the day before the training camp, um, Donnie calls and we reach, we reach at a core. We do a two year deal at uh, 245 and 255. And um, I know, and then Wendell missed a lot of games that year too, which I, which I knew was going to be the case. I had no problem. And then ultimately, you know, Wendell got hundred percent healthy and was really a really great story that way. So uh, we were in new market, Ontario, a training camp. So it was the day before. So Donnie just said, okay, tomorrow's the medicals. And uh, we'll sign it, and uh, Wendell will take us out for lunch. 
So he signed it. We went to like, I think O'Toole's, it cost Wendell like 35 bucks or something for lunch for the three of us <laughs> or whatever it did. So the next day is the first day of on ice, like the first day and you're sitting there and it's blue and white scrimmage and they're all out there. And oh, and then Ballard arrives and um, he asked his Wendell's contract all, you know, good. And uh, um, I said, yeah, you know what I mean? And he was happy about that. Then he says, he like, you know, yeah, where is it? I'd like, to, I'd like to, I'd like to sign it, which caught me off guard because he never really signed contracts. He signed like say Borea Somings and you know, the old adage, I already sent it to NHL central registry in Montreal. So I'm thinking that's not the answer he really wants to hear. So I quickly looked in the uh, new market St. Office and there was a blank contract and Wendell's on the ice at that time, part of the group that's on. So I go to the boards Wendell's and I said, there's Mr. Ballard there. You know, he's really excited. You're back. He wants to sign your contract. I already sent it to NHL central registry. I've got a, I've got an empty, I've got a contract here. If you can see, you know, I'll just fold it in three. So would you mind redoing it, right? So anyway, God love Wendell. He says fine. So uh, I got Mr. Ballard put in one of those little small rooms, like say a referee uses there, small desk. So I come there with the fake contract. And a second later, you hear <laughs> like that sound of, of skate blades hitting the floor. Wendell comes in. And uh, so Harold gets to say his piece about how much it's great to have him back. And uh, I don't know who signed first, but say Ballard, you know, I'm kind of covering it, signed it. And then Wendell leans over, <laughs> sweat is just pouring, pouring. Like the contract probably would be illegible, pouring. And he signed it again. They shook hands. Wendell, clang, 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 went back on the ice. Ballard went back in the stands. I tore the contract up. And uh, that's, how you think on, that's how you think on your feet around Harold Ballard. Oh, my God. Well, you're good at that, Gord. That's awesome. So okay, so what, what? How did it? Uh, how did it come? I mean, you talked about the court and all like Cordic uh, uh, trade, and then that's when you're you're fingered for. Is what are you doing? But I mean, I John obviously John Brophy had a lot to do with that trade. It was it was kind of like uh, that's where he wanted the team to go, and you you had to appease your coach to a degree. And and uh, you know it's uh, hindsight is 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 twenty twenty. But uh, what are you gonna do? <laughs> Well, it's like right. uh, I, I see my my reality taking the job when Milt Dunnell announced I had the job was also that John Brophy <laughs> right. uh, was was going was going to be the coach. And if I had to pick a coach, it wouldn't be John Brophy. But if I love a guy, it's John Brophy. Like I I love John Brophy. Right. But I understood that like, Harold loved him too. So I said, okay, here's a guy that's a great minor league coach, but he's in over his head in the NHL just because he he can't they won't relate to that minor league mentality. He does not have the same leverage on them like he thinks. So the guy that pissed him was Cordell and vice versa. And so, you know, we'd gone through the summer. We got started, you know, and things were, you know, we drafted Ty Domi for the future. We added some toughness in, in, in Brian Kern. Um, I, I, like, you know, I'm trying to think. We had a few of whatever. So, you know, I did, we did some of those kind of things. And season got going well and then you know one game it was in Chicago and I remember that Russ wasn't dressing and he just came and he was and I and I and I just I was just like dejected I said oh shoot like you know and so I just said you know yeah. just um okay just like you know I'll figure something out for you okay just 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 lay low and that like so Danny Dao was playing ahead of him in that case so a couple weeks later like the one guy and and Brof had been in Montreal when they won the Stanley Cup in 1986 and uh, John Cordick was 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 a was a big part of that in the playoffs, like that kind of toughness and that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. so that was so that was a guy he was extremely hot on. Uh, so yeah, it, it ends up being a bad trade. Nothing more you could say about it. If John Cord Cordick, unfortunately, who was a really funny guy, I really liked him. He obviously had a lot of demons. He obviously had addiction issues. Um, mm-hmm. He wasn't the same guy that broke from ever in '86. So so the trades made and. I'm I'm happy that I, I you know and maybe self survival wise it's not the best thing to do but I didn't grease the skids for Brof you know I uh, I I got him I made that move and then two months later uh, I convinced Harold to fire Brof that was a hard one so right anyway that's the way it went right it, that was a difficult difficult uh, job for you having to fire to fire uh, Brophy. Because you know, Brof is a like he's he was uh, I I think like obviously he was an old school guy, and not uh, not fit for the for the league at that particular time. 
but they did they did have their moments they did they, they had that year when they beat st louis in the playoffs and you know they're yeah oh yeah yeah and they, also they, they Joe, had, one more yeah yeah and one more how to handle harold moment involved brofe so you know brofe gets fired and um the next he phones me the next day and says look mr ballard wants to keep me around and you know whatever so he goes look i'm here if you want anything you know but if you want me to get the bleep out of here stay out of your way i'll do that too like just wonderful right so right. then again in the paper and i read it the next day ballard's talking and i and probably to milt dunnell a few others it just says you know <laughs> brof's gonna stay <laughs> which is great but he um you know he's gonna probably do some stuff in new market and that but of course that means he can't get paid the same amount of you know so now i got a call from bro and bro goes i may not be the brightest guy in the world but you know so what the hell so i go bro give me a couple hours right so i think about it and this is what i do again typing i take out an inner office yeah. memo and i and i type a memo to, to harold ballard from john brophy that just sinks and bro just talks about how well he's been treated the whole thing but you know what? I'm a coach. I want to coach, blah, blah, blah. Like, perfect. And I put it back in Ballard's, like, mail. And then an hour later, Ballard says to me, Gordy, uh, and I come back in, he goes, read this letter to me. Every now and then, he'd get me to read aloud something. So I'm yeah. reading aloud my letter I, I composed from John Brophy, right? <laughs> and, and so at the end of it, he goes, well, okay, that's it for Brophy then. And uh, he calls Don Crump down, the controller. And and he says uh, like like Brof we owed Brof was making 125 a year and he, so he says to Crump um, what do we owe him and Crump goes 175 we owe him and then Crump starts to say but you can present value it and we getting Harold says no no don't present value it just cut him a check cut him a check so then I phone Brof I said come down in two hours he had a check for 175 thousand dollars he guys so wow. so he walked out didn't that, you know and all you know very 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 super amicable but again trying to trying to trying to figure a way out of it uh, and uh anyway did you ever type uh, harold a letter from the queen or anything like that or <laughs> yeah i know he loved the queen. i no yeah yeah no i didn't i didn't <laughs> I make it sound like there was a lot of skullduggery and other going on. It just was trying to <laughs> trying to think on my feet and stay ahead of it. I only sent you the no, last man, you, you're you, the only guy that got it. You did. I'm the only guy. I'm just just me. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, so that was okay. So then, you know, eventually the poop hits the, uh, the the fan, and and you end up leaving. You know, I guess it came down to when you left Toronto. Was was it just enough? Was enough? Well, it, it wasn't um, in the like, people think I got fired from Toronto, which I didn't. And and I left because, um, it, it, you know, like the coaching in, in getting Brophy replaced, I had to convince Harold about George Armstrong, fill, you know, um, filling in. That was the only guy that, that, that Harold would accept. And then he really fell in love with Armstrong. And so I sort of became the secondary guy and, and we couldn't get George out of the and every time we push about, we want a new coach. Harold would get pissed at me trying to push George out. And it just got too deep into the summer that way. And then uh, Neil Smith, which I guess nowadays would be tampering, um, called me and uh, offered me um, assistant general manager's job with the New York Rangers. And I, you know, I just recognized with, with all that was going on outside with, you know, the distractions with uh, his, his family and Yolanda and thing, it just was, and we had to get, you know, I talked to guy. I talked to Barry Melrose, was one of the guys about you know getting getting a coach in place. I got my kitchen, and as an assistant coach, which ends up being a a great hire. He's a great friend. You know, little dribs and drabs. So when I did leave for New York, I mean that kind of that kind of brought it to a head. And George kind of did an all or nothing with Harold, and Harold kind of looked to fire him. But then George had a contract that I give him, and I'm glad about that. All all was good, and yeah, it it, it, it just it, it hurt me that it came to that, and um. You know, and when I left, I realized that I, it was not the smart thing to leave like that and start the next week somewhere else because I'd, I'd had 14 years. Everything everything was there, you know, my culture and all that stuff. So I, I can't say I regret leaving. I don't even know what to say. It's just unfortunate because there would have been there were some other opportunities that could have come up. But just uh, New York didn't work out so so well with me and Neil Smith. It ended up being a great experience. But, you know, you're, everyone's got life lessons about things. And. You know, one thing about Harold Ballard, he was he was the boss. So, you know, he was in front of you, you know, whatever, you know, he asked reasonable, unreasonable, whatever. We all have that with certain bosses, but you learn that the guy that you think is your ally, in this case, Neil Smith, 
uh, is the guy that can screw you more ultimately down the road. And so be it. That's what happened. And uh, that case, in that case, I got fired after two years. But it, it, there were a lot of positives I took out of it. Right. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because our old pal Paul Patsko has uh, had found a clip of you from the Rangers broadcast in the spring of 1990. We're going to play that for, for us. Uh, now I'm going to have Vic play that for us. Vic, uh, it's because the blue shirts seem to panic. turn around here. I think here. that's a credit to, to Neil and to Roger Nielsen. I think that was the biggest part that we, we recognized that we had a good team and the goal still was to make the playoffs. In the past, uh, we sort of thrived on the turmoil in New York as far as that went, and that's something that Roger and Neil put to rest right away, made some very constructive trades and just made took each game one at a time, uh, like the cliche goes, but uh, when you put a few together and we're, we're where we are today. So I think uh, credit goes to the players, but I think Neil and Roger, their leadership was demonstrated and tested and came off quite well then so i'm looking at that clip and i'm thinking okay just just a couple years later uh you know the rangers won the stanley cup right you put some of the pieces yeah. together for that team you helped put some of the pieces to get together for that team you helped put, put some of the pieces together together for that maple east team that that uh, ended up you know having a good run in in, in 93 as well uh so what are your you know thoughts you know, you know about, about that uh, situation back then do you feel like you uh, you you learned a lot? Did a great job there. Oh yeah, you know, you know, I um, it, it's always for other people to judge, but I'm uh, you know, I'm pleased with uh, uh, what uh, I did in my involvement in both cases. Like I I kind of kidded about the uh, like that eighty nine ninety team. I still consider like mine, even though I left a few weeks before. Right, that was a fun team that would lose game, win game six five or you know, on and on. And, and that was a yeah. bit of the style that we were looking at. And uh, I, I'm i happy that the only young guy we lost was Russ Cordell because, you know, we had Eddie Olchuk, Gary Lehman, Daniel Merwa, Vinny Domfus, and, you know, just like there was a young nucleus there and there could have been a temptation to trade more of them. So, yeah, I, I, I was, I was, you know, uh, hey, do you make mistakes? Of course you make mistakes, but I was happy about that. Then on the New York side, and that's why it pissed me off so much when, when you know, you get – you get flipped at the end because I gave Neil a lot of help early on. Roger was the key guy. I got to work with Roger Nielsen twice in Toronto, New York. Like what a treasure, what a treasure. Uh, and um, he was the guy that kind of righted the ship there initially. Ultimately, of course, you know, with Mike Keenan coaching when they won the Stanley Cup. But I, I like that I have a, particularly with the Leaf alumni guys from that era, some of the Ranger ones too, but, you know, really good, strong, positive relationships. And the one they always talk about, Joe, and, uh, is like guys wore the leaf with a lot of pride. You know, we kind of make fun like the Ballard era, a lot of, but you know what? The guys wore the sweater with a lot of pride. There were a lot of very proud Toronto Maple Leaf players, and there were successes. Uh, you, you, everyone does a, does a paintbrush about, you know, the whole era. Uh, there were successes along the way. Um, not enough of them, but there were. You, uh, you've penned a couple of books. Uh Thanks to your typing skills, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> Hockey heartaches and hell, with along with Jim O'Leary, and uh, you know I, I suspect uh, Hal played a lot of a prominent role in a lot of those heartaches. And uh, '67, the Maple Leafs, their sensational victory in the end of an empire, along with uh, Damian Cox. Uh, tell us about those those two books, uh, and and what kind of like prompted you to want to write them. Well, the. Uh... Punch Imlach, his second time he came around and he wrote a few books and he kind of said, boy, you're going to have a hell of a book sometime. Like he, he always called me kid and that. And the, the first one, Hockey Heartaches in Hell, was in some ways therapy for being on this roller coaster ride <laughs> with the Maple Leafs that, that really sped up when I was general manager. And, and it's not, it's, it's, it's not a, mo it's not a piss and moaning book. It's not that like it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it, it just is kind of some of the funny things and the quirky things about working with Harold Ballard. And, you know, it's actually a great read now. It's a better read now than when it came out. Cause it came out, you know, it was still, still too raw for fans back then. Cause it's right after I left. Yeah, uh, Jim O'Leary's an outstanding writer, so um, so so that part was great. There was that, you know, like whatever, almost like I said, it was almost like therapy. And the '67 book um, was just a wonderful, wonderful, passionate um, work that I'm extremely proud of. You know, it was a great partnership with myself and Damian Cox, and uh, we, you know, we complemented each other well because he's the better writer. He can look at things objectively. Um, I knew the guys, so, you know, and, and that, so mine's a little bit different, a little bit passionate in that way. So, 
you know, we did it pretty well that, uh, like, I got to talk to every player on the team. I talked to uh, someone from the Horton family. I talked to Terry Sawchuk's uh, son. And it was really, really neat. It was just such a – and I was – and I remember when Bobby Haggard, who's since passed away, but he was the longtime train, he was the trainer for those teams and that team. And he, he was a big help, too, on the, a big resource on the book. And he called and he goes, man, you nailed it. You guys nailed it. And I just said that I was thrilled because you wanted to tell. And, you know, Brian Conacher's wife did the same thing. Jim Pappen, the same thing. And, and um, you know, so I, I felt great about it because it's this, okay, we always talk about 67. So what exactly was 67? And, Joe, what, what I liked was it gave credit to guys that didn't get credit because the, the Stanley Cups 62, 64 were one thing the usual cast of characters, but 67, the best pair on D was not Horton and Stanley. It was Larry Hillman and Marcel Pronovo. Larry Hillman was the best defenseman outside of Bauer and Sawchuk. He was their best, you know, defending guy, right? Uh, and up front, it was it was uh, Bob Pulford, Pete Stemkowski, Jim Pappen was the best line. And Mike Walton played a strong role. And Brian Conacher played a strong role. So they all think about punch sending those six old guys out for yeah. that final face off the empty net draw when George Armstrong puts it in the net. But other guys that got kind of short shrift got, uh, did, got and appreciated getting their uh, due accolades in the book. Yeah. I mean, that, well, obviously it takes a team to win. And I think this is a good place to transition. Speaking of 1967, we're looking at this year's uh, version of the Maple Leafs and what the heck happened to this team? Because I mean, heading into the season, let's, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, where they were, what happened to them last spring, and you think Dubas has some areas that he has to address, right? He has to address the toughness. He has to address that veteran leadership. And he seemed to do that, And and uh, but here we are, Leafs out in the first round once again. What, how do you, uh, what's your analysis of what, what came down here? Well, I had a chance to think about it the day before game seven and since. And Joe, this is the, this is the most devastating loss ever. That's saying a lot. And I've been around for a lot. Like, you know, people start quibbling and, and you know, well, use 93, for example. You know, Wayne Gretzky, the best game he ever played was game seven, Maple Leaf Gardens. Well, if that game went 15 more seconds, Doug Gilmore would have tied it up. They were battling right to the end, you know, against the LA Kings in that one. They were twice in the Pat Quinn regime where they got to the final four. And each time they went out in five games, once was to Buffalo, once was to Carolina. But the key thing was they won two rounds to get there. OK, so they right. won two rounds. To and get were there. hurt. So, yeah. And then and then the last, mm -hmm. you know, you OK, the three goal deficit to the Bruins the first time. The Boston was a way better team. Toronto had no business and good on them, you know, that. But anyway, that one hurt. But Boston was a better team. And then, you know, the last few times Washington was OK. That was growing pains. Then, the, then the next few times with Boston, the second one, the Leafs had it. They were up one nothing in Game Six. Couldn't close the deal, like Game Six to close it, and then couldn't close it in Game Seven. Columbus was a complete bleep show. I mean, they just didn't show up. I mean, the bubble wasn't for everybody. Washington, St. Louis, and Boston also didn't have positive bubble experiences. It was a artificial environment that way. But uh, that was a horrible display by the Toronto Maple Police. So. Joe, they righted the ship this year in the regular season. That's what I gave them credit for. I mean, they didn't have to play Tampa Bay and Boston. I mean, it was a weaker division, but that's fine. That's yeah. fine. They they won it. They won it. And then they get it. So Tavares gets injured. They win the next three games with, without John Tavares, okay? So all of a sudden, don't do the revisionist history. You won three games without John Tavares. I could not believe in games five, six, seven, the lack of compete, the lack of not showing up in time, how uninspiring it was. I don't get it. Game seven was flat out hard to watch. So some people said, like, how mad are Lee fans? You shouldn't be mad at all. That was hard to watch. Being mad is when, you you know, an overtime goal beats you or whatever. I'm I'm shocked and stunned. And I love this team. And I, you know, and uh, I, I like their core players. Like, Joe, we're talking about things that a week before game five or, say, a week before you would not be talking about. A couple of days before game five, you net now, now everything's fair game. You know, everyone's got to wear it starting from Brendan Shanahan to a degree about, I mean, this is not a little thing. This is like the, the comparable I have is about having kids and your kids say has a 70 in a, in a subject and then goes to write their final exam and flunks, flunks the course. Wait, what? I got it. Well, I got a zero on my phone. Well, how, how the hell would you get that? I mean, that's, that's almost like you kind of go like, what? I don't, I don't, I, I don't even yeah. know how to start 
to process it all. Well, you know, because you, you referred to the Tavares injury, and I mean, that's a significant injury. You know, you lose Tavares, that's a significant injury. But somehow, uh, and then Muzzin going, going down in game six, another another uh, significant injury. And, and uh, you know, you can, look, you can point the fingers and blame it on the injuries. But, you know, there still are 22 guys there, and, and somebody's got to pick up the slack. And they managed to do it in those three games after Tavares went down. And so what happened? So, okay, so so take that GM hat out of mothballs and put it back on again. What What is Gord Stella going to do here now, go moving forward? What what kind of moves are you going to make? Or, or become president of the, of the club and, and, and decide that you're going to make the move? Or even the ownership group and decide maybe the president. Oh, that would be nice. Go. I don't know. What do you think? That would be, well, well <laughs> I, I, would, I would think that, uh, well, first of all, I always said that I, and this is no slight against Kyle Dubas in the slightest, truly not. But Lou Lamorello went at least one year too early, you know, and, and, you know, Kyle was enjoying a great apprenticeship with him, running the Toronto Marlies, winning the Calder Cup and all that. So, I mean, but that ship has sailed. Okay. Um, I think Kyle has to be apoplectic about what happened because I really can't fault his moves. So I'm not going to be a hypocrite now that I like the leadership that yeah. he brought in. I liked his trade deadline moves, you know? Um, so I, I, you know, and, and Sheldon Keith is his guy and Sheldon Keith impressed me, but something went south there. Like something went south. And I, Joe, I can't quite say this is like the year before the Raptors won the championship when they had that four game sweep against and things you never thought of would happen that Dwayne Casey got fired and Nick Nurse became head coach and that Masai looked at the uh, Kawhi Leonard situation and decided got to yeah. go that way. I mean, so I'm saying, okay, Seth yeah. Jones is kind of that guy right now. He's a, he's a one-year hired gun with no guarantee he'll stay. He's a UFA after next year. I, I'm just throwing that out there, those kind of things that you yeah. might look at that you weren't looking at before. But um, you're, you're, you're stuck with those core guys. And, and again – any kind of criticism isn't personal. I know everything's about, oh, they're getting skewered on social media. Why would they look at social media? Okay, why would anyone about the negative yeah. stuff about, you yeah. know, why would you? Right. So, uh, you, you, but you got to, the sexist phrase, you got to man up and, or the female equivalent. Like, like, like what the, like, how, how could you not be, how could you not be seemingly interested? I don't question the heart, but I hate the word choke, so I don't use the word choke. It's being used a lot, but I but but give me something better to do. Uh, I I don't get it. It's 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 inexcusable. Well, and and you know, Kerry Fraser, uh, Kerry sorry, Kerry Fraser, Kerry Price is is a great goaltender. Kerry Price uh, played amazingly well, especially in those last uh, three games. But you know, J Jack Campbell was pretty much matched him. If you look at the stats, I mean, Campbell actually had a better goals against average. He had a lower, uh, uh, or sorry, better better save percentage and a lower goals against average. And in that series, and uh, you know, we, it, it's something other than that. There's something I know they allowed maybe they allowed Carey Price to get in their heads. But when you got a veteran group like that, I just don't know how you how how you can allow that to happen. Well, exactly, Joe. And Carey Price, like this revisionist, Carey Price did not steal the series, you know. And but to their credit as a team, uh, however, they seemed to limit. Um, like it wasn't even the Leafs weren't scoring goals; they weren't getting scoring chances the last few games. Like the style Montreal played, the Leafs had already diffused it. It's like there was a Montreal bomb. The Leafs diffuse it, and Game Five they put the same bomb at center ice, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God. And uh, they're not able to. And they play that dump and chase style. And the Leafs seemingly seemed happy to do it. The power play is inexcusable. Uh, you in you know you can say should the coaches split up the lines? I think an argument could be made that way. Like you know you kept going to the well, going to the well, going to the well. Like like somebody like like my typing. Find a point of difference. Find a point of difference to win one of those games. You only had to win one of them, and they couldn't do it. And, you know, a couple of years ago, it was the same thing with Mike Babcock. He kept going to the well, going to the well, going to the well. He wouldn't split up the lines, he, you know. And, and now we see Sheldon Keefe kind of doing the same thing. And one, one of the things we really liked about, I really liked about Sheldon Keefe when, he, when, he, when they made that move is that Keefe was willing to experiment. Keefe was willing to try new things. But it seemed that when push come to shove, he wasn't able to find those, those right combinations. And, you know, ultimately, I guess it comes down to, so if, so if you're, if you're, in the ownership group, running the ownership group, 
what's 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 your move here if anything well i i i'd call brendan shanahan in who you've made a commitment to this is he's been there seven years now and i have no problem the commitment yeah. they made to brendan shanahan i'm sure he does not need to be called in but just kind of saying like what's going on <laughs> okay like you know and i'm sure brendan would have said seven years ago like uh, like this wouldn't be where they're at either like you know he um one and again one of the strengths is you have to have to have perspective and that's what brendan will have you have to you can't listen to all the noise out there and you and me and everybody else and that you have to you know look through it and and and, and brendan's incredibly well versed he won a stanley cup in a detroit red wing situation that he knows it was good they stuck at it that it's uh, not a fun as he said i'm uh, so i'm thinking joe was a year and a half ago that I, I did a really enjoyable event, a hot, kind of a hot stove type thing with Brendan. There were about a thousand people there, and someone asked that question about what if you have another playoff disappointment? And he said, "Well, I know it's not the fun answer you want to hear, but you just got to get back at it." Well, this is before Columbus happened and before this one, so you know there's got to be a limit. And really, in Detroit, ultimately they won cups, but they won. You haven't won a playoff round. Like get in, in Detroit, the answer was Brendan Shanahan, the player was kind of you know the last piece but you also did not give up on steve eiserman and or not give up a trade him or things like that so i you know and, and that wouldn't be the answer moving those guys out so like it's just really a new conundrum all of a sudden like it's not something they were expecting seven days you know before the season end or before they got eliminated or five days to have to ask but you got to really really like what is it that caused that and we're you and i aren't in the dressing room and they're a lot closer and when you're closer, you gotta identify more what what is what is reality and 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 what is falling, you know. And um, they gotta figure that out. From what you've seen, are you willing to go with Jack uh, Campbell and let Freddie go? Uh, I, well, I, I'm I'm big on Freddie. Uh, unfortunately, Freddie kind of mirrors what's been with the team. His worst performances were in the playoffs. And then when he wasn't with the team, when he was the backup, once again, their worst performances were in the playoffs, unfortunately. But Jack Campbell, especially, everything's got a number affixed to it. And he's got one year left at $1.65 million. So that likely gives you the money to try to keep Zach Hyman because otherwise you're, you know, you're like many teams, you're in cap hell. And now there's flat cap hell. You know, there was always the anticipation yeah. pre-COVID. The cap would go up a bit. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good with Jack. Uh, problem is, Joe, that the Toronto Maple Leafs, like you look at the Boston Bruins, call you know, with Swayman and those guys coming up from the American Hockey League, Toronto Maple Leafs have not fully developed a number one goaltender from within since Felix Botvin. Okay, uh, James Reimer is a bit mm -hmm. of a asterisk there, but it was supposed to be Justin Pogge back then. And I, I like James Reimer, so I'll give him full marks. But have not developed. Like I mean, you're talking like 25 years. Like you, you've got to always have someone coming. Like you've got to have, you know, someone coming that's on the verge of breaking into the NHL in, in every position, really. But in goal is one they they've just never had that, and you know that's what you wish depth wise was there because you know David Riddick's a free agent, uh, Freddie Anderson's a free agent. You're going to be limited money wise, uh, likely if you stay with the same lineup. What other goaltender you can get? Well, uh, Sparks was supposed to be the guy, and it looked like when he was in the minors, he might be the guy. And and then, of course, he, when when he got to the big club, he just there's a certain mentality that you have to have once you reach once once you reach that level. And Toronto can't be an easy place to play, so it makes it a difficult challenge for him. It really does. But uh, yeah, they got to shore up. You know, they got to find somebody who can who can do it. They got to develop somebody. You're right. Okay, so just a quick uh, look ahead to uh, the teams that are left. What who impresses you? What what uh, what do you, who are you expecting to see in the final? So the Colorado Avalanche, in a lot of ways, three years ago, if you're a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, you could reasonably say that in three years' time, we the Leafs should be what the Colorado Avalanche are right now. They're kicking ass. They are absolutely steamrolling by everybody, and Nathan McKinnon is stepping up. Not just him, Landeskog as well, and doing what unfortunately did not happen to that degree from. The leaders of this leaf team so i just look like wow have they ever you know i thought it's going to be them in vegas playing right now um too bad that wasn't a stanley cup you know the next round match but that's the way it goes just like too bad tampa bay carolina wasn't the next round match so i had picked colorado to win the stanley cup um i had picked carolina 
to upset Tampa Bay, uh, that's going to be difficult because, man, the Lightning are defending Stanley Cup champions. And, you know, you get Kucherov back for the playoffs. You forget they have a great D. And then you forget, oh, yeah, guys like Kalorn and Palat, they're there too. They've been there for a long time. So they have this all kind of depth. So they've um, – They've really turned it up a notch, and then, but whoever comes out Boston and the New York Islanders, that's going to be a, a, an interesting battle. I think they'll give whoever a battle. So I had said it would be Carolina and Colorado with Colorado winning it. Um, I um, I I'm going to take a I could take a little mulligan right now and probably put Tampa Bay uh, as the team beating Carolina. But you know what, Joe? And this is another part about the Canadian division of the Scotia North division. There were eight different playoff series. And this, and I think a lot of it was because they had a lot of fans in the buildings. Those other ones kicked ass. Like like Edmonton, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal paled in conspar- comparison. You know, they they were kind of entertainment wise and intensity wise um, the weakest games. Yeah, and you know what? It, it's you're right. I, I I totally agree with you on Colorado. They really stepped it up. And you know, and you look at Tampa too. Kucherov. I mean, he looks like he hasn't missed a beat. Like he he looked like he'd been playing all year. And maybe having him off for the entire season might turn out to be a real good thing because he's flying in the playoffs and he's totally healthy and he's he's got lots of he's got his wheels going. Edmonds good. I mean, they're they're an awesome team. I I, I think it's going to be Tampa Colorado in the final, and I think uh, maybe Tampa wins it again. Yeah. Well, I'll pick Colorado. Good, then, that's one. Oh yeah. So yeah, I'll think, would, so at, least we, take we, at least we can argue about that. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, Gordon. Listen, I I I want to thank you for being on the show today. It's been been a lot of fun. And uh, as a guest on Joe Tilly Sports, we got a, a foursome at clubbing for you. Uh, when we come back uh, after the break, our, our good pal Aldo is going to drop by to enlighten us about all, uh, Canada's new mortgage stress test. You don't want to miss that. And uh, stick around. All right. Thanks again, Gordon. Thanks, Joe. Real pleasure. Promotional consideration provided by Clublink. Clublink. One membership, more golf. Slow play. It's a slippery slope. First you go looking for that lost ball, and then everything goes sideways. There are a lot of golfers on the course. Make certain of your point of entry, look quickly, and move on. Remember, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Find anything, Bob? Not yet. Addiction Rehab Toronto. Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by COSA, Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at CosaOnline.com and check out Cosa TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing year round. Go to HPIBet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today and your first bet is free. That's HPIBet.com. Uh, Aldo Udovicic from Remax Cross Roads. Aldo is one of the preeminent real estate brokers in the country, over 30 years in the business. He's a man of integrity who helps a lot of people, and we are re- we really honor his opinion. We honor his sponsorship on our program. And also, uh, we've got uh, some information that just came out recently. Aldo, the new stress test for mortgages has now been implemented. First of all, welcome to the program. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. You're a good man. Thank you, sir. So who determines the parameters of this stress test and uh, who does it affect? Well, stress test was initiated by the Office of, Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, who initially announced that the new qualifying rate would be 
would only be for uninsured mortgages, those with 20% or more down payments. However, the Canadian Department of Finance, Finances quickly followed the lead set by the OSFI and applied the higher qualifying rate to insured mortgages as well, which kind of made no sense. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, what does this mean? Well, it means that all potential homeowners will now need to prove that they can afford their mortgages at higher rates as lenders are restricting loans based on the five and a quarter percent test rate. So if you're a first time home buyer, you know, the ones that Mr. Trudeau said yesterday, they most wanted to help the ones that had to save 23 years for a down payment. Well, not only do you have to save 23 years for a down payment, now you need to prove that you can't qualify only for a 2.04 mortgage for a five year rate. You got to qualify at five and a quarter, which is a little bit excessive. Where Where is this happening? Uh, it's a proactive move by the government, Joe, to help protect all the banks from home buyers who are overextending themselves throughout the whole of Canada. So it's not only an Ontario thing. So, well, okay. So when does this stress test, uh, stress test come into effect officially? Actually, actually Joe, it, it came into effect yesterday, June 1st. So the stress, stress test has been increased to five and a quarter, like I said, from 4.79 when the stress test was first introduced in 2017. It's important to note that the new stress test is only going to impact buyers who purchase from today onwards or yesterday onwards. And it's also important to note that the lenders who who were people that were pre-qualified prior to yesterday won't be getting grandfathered in with their existing pre-approvals. Okay, so what kind of an effect is this going to have on the market? Well, the expected effect is that they'll cool off the market and especially it'll have enough adverse effect on first time home buyers by decreasing affordability by about 5%. And those are the people that have been suffering the most all along. So why was, uh, why was it determined that the stress test was necessary? Well, in the financial world, Joe, a stress test is simply planning for the worst case scenario. The mortgage stress test is in place to help determine how you would cope if your mortgage payments, actually if your interest rates were to rise and your financial institutions were to change unexpectedly, but basically the banks are protecting themselves from inflation and rising interest rates. Surprise, surprise, Joe. The banks are hedging their bets against mortgage defaults even though mortgages are under 20% are completely insured. So that makes no sense to me. This has a compounding effect on buyers who have been battling to qualify for mortgages already. So for all you first time buyers out there, be nice to your parents. Always nice to mom and dad, although you got to do that for sure. Okay, thanks, Ola. But before we go, I want to get your opinion. You just, we just on the show here, you, you saw Gord Stellick on the program talking about the Maple Leafs and the demise, demise of the Maple Leafs. What do you, what do you think happened to the Leafs? I, I, I kind of, it's a conundrum like, like Gord was saying. I don't know. I just think that they, They've got this bad luck thing going on, and uh, John Tavares going out and Muzzin going out was a bad thing. However, I was born in Montreal, so my uh, loyalties are divided, so I don't think I should <laughs> go in, uh, too deep in that. Well, I'm glad you didn't wear your Habs hat anyway. That, that, that at least saved us yeah. that. So, okay, I know you're also you're all the, you're a big tennis fan. Uh, these are boom times for Canadian tennis. I mean, we've never seen anything like it, although we're, they're struggling a little bit at the French Open. Matter of fact, they're all out now. But some of them didn't even play in the French Open. But uh, who, tops, who tops the list for you in terms of Canadian tennis right now? I really like, uh, you know, I just like I like Brownich, and I think Shapovalov is a is a great player. But the young one there that that lost this morning, Fernandez. Oh, Layla, Layla, yeah, yeah. Layla, yeah, she's a she's a firecracker. I think she's going to do great. We, you know, I don't know. They've gotten to the top top echelon, and then they seem to not be able to hang on. But then again, nobody can. It's a, it's a tough tough threesome to crack it these 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 days. Well, especially on the, on the men's side, I mean, yeah, yeah, Djokovic and, and Rafa, you know, it's hard to beat those guys. And Federer still got a little bit of game in him anyway. Uh, okay, so are you, you you planning to go to the Rogers Cup this uh, this uh, this summer? Uh, yeah, we buy tickets. We, we've got tickets there every year, so we do support that pretty strongly, and, and we okay. love the tennis for sure. What's, okay, who's your favorite player, Canadian or otherwise, to watch? Well... My parents are Croatian, so obviously it, it's it's a natural choice for me to pick a Serbian. 
with Djokovic. And I, uh, I really think that he's, we're watching history, you know, we're watching the best, the best of the best, you know, Roger was the best, I think. And, uh, Djokovic, if he stays healthy, may may take that mantle. But you can't argue. There's a lot of argument for Rafa too. So, who knows? Oh, they are dominant right now. I mean, I, I even even when Borg and McEnroe and those guys were on. I mean, other guys would win. Lendl would come in there and win for a while. But right now, these guys just are just. It's hard to knock either of those two guys off. It's incredible. Well, listen, Aldo, I want to thank you for uh, for being on the show today and helping us uh, better understand the Canadian mortgage situation. Uh, I, uh, if for anybody who's interested in, in buying or selling a home, Aldo is the guy to see. Absolutely. I can't trust anybody more than you can trust this guy. So call Aldo anytime for your real estate needs at 416 get Aldo or go to getaldo.com. And Aldo, thanks again for being on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. They can all ask me for our white glove service. We'll, we'll show them what that's all about. From the time you call me until the time you move, you don't have to do anything else. You just make that call and everything will happen. Thanks a lot, Joe. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Have a good day. Okay. It's time now for my COSA Swiss pick of the week. You know, last week I went to Harris Philly for the $100,000 Maxi Lee Trot. I liked It's Academic from that tough eight hole. That was a mistake, folks. I also said Manchego, though, would win, would go go for the Manchego and It's Academic Exactor. Well, I was half right. Manchego with Dexter Dunn on the buggy got it done in 151 and three. That's a track record for a mare trot. Nancy Tactor trains. It's academic got squeezed at the top of the stretch and had to settle for fourth. This week, we're going to go to Vernon Downs in New York for the 12th race, a division of the New York Sire Stakes for three year old Colt Trotters, a $57,000 purse. And I like the number two horse, Credit Con. Two wins in two seconds and five starts, driven by Scott Zeron for trainer trainer Wally Hennessy. My record on the year is now five wins, two seconds, two thirds, three fourths, a fifth, two eighths, and a tenth. For all the racing updates, updates visit Costa TV on Facebook. Go to hpibet.com for your wagering options. There are many tracks racing in other parts of North America right now that you can wager on. And we will be racing soon, hopefully. It was a better week for the Blue Jays, who have now made their way up north to Buffalo for the next little while. You know, they played well in their New York State home. Uh, still having some issues with the bullpen, but they've got a couple of series wins now to get right back in the thick of that wild car, wild car race. And did you catch the Major League debut of Alec Manoa? Okay, the Jays' first-round pick from 2019, 11th overall, mowed down that powerful Yankees lineup right in the Bronx in his big league debut. Manoa allowed just two hits over six innings with seven strikeouts in a 2-0 Jays win. You know, this kid, he's only pitched 35 innings in the minor leagues before getting called up, and what a potential future he had. Well, half the conference semifinals are set. Yeah, there's his mom, yeah. All right, go, Alec. All right, half the uh, conference semifinals are set in the NBA East. The Nets, who might just win it all, are joined by the Bucks. They'll likely be joined by the Hawks and the 76ers. In the West, it's all up for grabs right now, although the Jazz need just one win. And LeBron's Lakers are now on the brink after getting smoked in Game 5. Doesn't look good for the de defending champs with AD on the line with that groin injury. Uh, Floyd Money Mayweather climbs back into the ring against YouTube star Jake Paul. This in Miami on Sunday. They'll both make several million dollars on the pay-per-view buys. The 44-year-old Mayweather is giving up 40 pounds, 6 inches, and 18 years in age. But we're talking about the former undisputed pound-for-pound -pound champion of the world here. Even at 60, this guy would box Jake Paul's ears off. I can't see this even being close. Uh, Chad Ochocinco fights on the undercard. Okay, now we close the show with a look at all the folks who make it possible. They are friends trusted business associates, all around great folks like Aldo. I highly recommend them all. A reminder that the show is also available on the Spanglish Network and on Zingo TV and the Fired Up Network. Once again, thanks to Gord Stillock and Aldo for being on the show. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week when the boys drop by, Rod Black and Humble Howard, as we do our U.S. Open preview. We'll see you then. Get Aldo at Remax Crossroads. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Call 416 Get Aldo or visit www.getaldo.com to find out what next level real estate looks like.
RS Demolition and Excavation has extensive experience with complete teardowns and interior strip outs. Looking to build a custom home? RS Excavating Services has the experience you need to build in established neighborhoods. For the highest level of quality and cost-efficient results, we provide innovative demolition solutions completed on time and on budget while ensuring our number one priority, safety. Call 647-852-3006 for an estimate or visit rsdemolition.ca. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. And let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did 905-686-5678. Gold Line Resources, discovering high-grade gold in Sweden. Gold Line Resources owns a prospective portfolio of four high-grade gold exploration projects located on the Gold Line Mineral Belt of north-central Sweden and one gold exploration project in the Skelftia Belt of north-central Sweden. For more information on how you can invest in this new initiative, go to goldlineresources.com or call one 800 858 9710. Gold Line Resources can also be found on the TSX Ventures Exchange as GLDL. Looking for an advantage in choosing your investment options? Belmont Venture Capital will provide you with the best up-to-date opportunities in the mid-cap and junior sector. The company was formed 12 and a half years ago and is spearheaded by two seasoned veterans of the financial markets with over 80 years combined experience. Go to BelmontVentureCapital.com today for the latest hot picks on the market. And don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. BelmontVentureCapital.com Brought to you by MNP, one of Canada's leaders in national accounting as well as tax and business consulting. We proudly serve and respond to the needs of clients in the private, public, and not-for-profit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, we provide a collaborative, cost-effective approach to doing business and personalized strategies helping people and organizations succeed across the country and around the world. Call MNP's Durham office today, 905-579-5531, or go to mnp.ca.